I'm Professor Sampath Senegatna. I'm a professor uh, in zoology at the Department of Zoology and Environment Sciences, the University of Colombo. While I'm teaching students about animals and environment, I'm a scientist specializes in the evolution of birds, bird ecology, endemism, and uh, in this context, the migration ecology of uh, birds in the Central Asian flyway. My PhD student, uh, Ms. Gaivani Panagoda, is a, is a PhD candidate and she is working on migration ecology of birds in this flyway which, which we call Central Asian Flyway, which spans across Asia, across 30 countries, where Sri Lanka locates in a, a pivotal position. Sri Lanka has about 500 species of birds. Of that 500 species, about 250 species are born and raised and die in this island. Therefore, we call them resident species. Of that resident species, about 34 species are only found in Sri Lanka, where we call them endemic species to Sri Lanka. The rest of the 250 species of birds are called migrants or migratory birds or we also call them winter visitors where they breed in other parts of the world and during the winter months they come to Sri Lanka and spend about six months here with our environment and with our other birds. We call them the winter migrants or migratory birds. Mana in that context is a very important place because they fly through Mana in the process of entering to Sri Lanka and leaving after uh, six, spending about six months. Uh, so these days, uh, as we are doing this uh, special uh, tagging system, uh, which we call uh, satellite tagging or GSM GPS tagging, uh, it's, a, it's a quite sophisticated uh, cutting-edge uh, technology available uh, for this sort of uh, migrated studies uh, across the globe. And actually, this, the, the technology that we use here is quite new. Uh, for example, this is a satellite, this is a tag that we are using. This is quite expensive, about, uh, about the same price as a, a small laptop. It has a solar panel to recharge the battery. It charges the battery every, every day from morning to uh, afternoon. And, uh, and then it has a GPS unit, global positioning uh, unit, where it, it can uh, uh, communicate with the, with the satellite and uh, uh, recognize its position across anywhere in the globe. And then it has an antenna to transmit uh, and communicate with the satellite, and then a, then a circuit too that detects the motion, uh, the movement, because uh, this this device can tell us the actual location of uh, of this bird. So that's quite a bit of information, and that can come in every half an hour, or every two hours, or once a day, depending on the way how we program. Uh, so these those data will uh, can be propagated onto a base map, and that map. By looking through uh, time, we would be able to know uh, the, the locations of the, the bird. For example, in this case, this bird, uh, it's a Huglin gull, data points in every half an hour over a span of a couple of years. And in the process, we now know its exact uh, migratory route. It uh, flew from uh, Mana, where we banded at uh, Urumale. Uh, to Tamil Nadu and then it flew across India uh, to uh, Kerala beach and from there Goa to Maharashtra and then to uh, Gujarat. And in Gujarat uh, it flew to uh, Pakistan and uh, entered into Lahore and spent few days in, at Lahore and then went to Kandahar, Afghanistan and then Tajikistan to Kazakhstan and through Kazakhstan it went into the Orb River in Russia and along the Ob River it flew to, uh, towards uh, Europe and eventually crossed the Urals and uh, entered into Europe. So in the process it flew 24,000 uh, kilometers, crossed nine countries, 25 main cities uh, and uh, 24,000 kilometers. What this thing does, it, when you attach it to a, deploy it to a, a, a bird, uh, it will tell us where these birds go outside the borders of the Sri Lanka. Because we get birds from uh, about one third of the terrestrial world of this planet, uh, ranging from uh, far eastern Russia and uh, Alaska, western Alaska in the in the eastern side, 
and uh, the Arctic uh, across the northern side and then the, uh, the Europe, uh, Scandinavia and the Urals in the Alps in the west and in between. So all these birds uh, including India, Himalayas, Mongolia, Kazakhstan and the southern Russia, eastern China, Australia, they all eventually come and uh, would come uh, potentially come to Sri Lanka. But the problem is that we don't know exactly where they come from and also we don't know where they, what kind of a flight plan they use, what kind of a stopover sites they use and what kind of a directions that they take as they fly. So this will tell us never a set of information about how they do that. So we have here like three different uh, designs. Mostly this, uh, the design is uh, uh, governed by the, the requirement of the bird, like you know the limita limitations of the bird. For example, this is a decoy of a bar-tailed godwit. I mean, it's not the best uh, uh, replication, but it has the correct size and the correct shape. Uh, I'm just using that as a, an example. So, so th if I try to put this one, it, it's too big because the international standard for these uh, uh, these tags is to have three percent. Of the to, to only to uh, go up to three percent of the body weight. So if you are if you have say hundred uh, gram bird, then you you can only have three gram uh, the maximum three gram uh, weight for the for the tag and the harness and everything. So that is a huge limitation when it comes to uh, deploying these. So we have to go for uh, a specific size class, and this one is about six grams. And uh, it has two antennas, solar panel, and uh, and the, the device. Uh, the advantage of this, this all these three technologies is that we don't entirely depend on satellite technology because uh, relying on satellites is very expensive. You have to pay subscription, annual subscription, and also satellite companies charge a lot. But uh, instead, we depend uh, on the GSM networks, the mobile uh, network. Uh, in uh, whatever the countries that these birds f fly, go through. So that way it's, it gives us the same quality of information in a much cheaper cost and we don't have to subscribe, uh, have to go for an annual subscription basis, so which is uh, much more sophisticated in a way and a simpler system for us. So these three tags that we use, this is a smaller one which is about 6 grams, so that means uh, it can go. It can go to birds like um, green shanks, red shanks, and then uh, crab plovers. Uh, that sort of birds ca can get this. So anything about uh, slightly below 200 grams, this tag is the is the way to go. It has small attachment positions for the jacket, the harness to go. And this tag is about nine grams. It has the same same extract uh, exact uh, architecture except that uh, this one has a uh, feather guard because as the feathers grow the, the feathers could interfere the solar panel and that would interfere the charging, daily charging of the battery. Uh, but otherwise it's the same but you can remove this if you want. Normally we remove this uh, to keep the weight even lower and it has a, a prominent antenna and this normally it goes something like this onto the back. There's two ways to do that. One uh, uh, way is that you can put it into the, uh, the rump, the back of the bird. The other way is that you can put it into the, uh, the saddle. So normally we put it this way. There are different ways of doing it. Uh, this is for larger godwits, curlews, Eurasian curlew, uh, uh, oyster catcher could get this. And then the third type kind is 23 grams. It's quite heavy. It doesn't have a jutting out antenna, but it's heavy. Uh, but uh, it's in a way, its structure is sophisticated because it, it has the solar panel uh, slightly raised from the uh, unit. Because this can go to go on ducks, eagles, like pelicans, like like bigger feathery uh, birds, like uh, uh, bigger in size. Uh, so so since it's 23 grams, it has to go like uh, it can go to birds about six. 600 grams so uh, above. It also has a solar panel, GPS unit, uh, the, the motion detector, temperature detector and the light sensor. 
so it will tell you whether it's a it's a day or night. Uh, so that's the three basic uh, devices that we use for three different uh, uh, types of birds. When we comes to the geographical position of Sri Lanka, we are uniquely positioned in this in the world map. We are truly the center of Asia. North of us, we have the Indian subcontinent, and then the Asia, a bit of Europe. From south of us, we have the great Indian Ocean. If a bird flies from north through Asia to south through the southern Indian peninsula, it will end up in Sri Lanka. And beyond Sri Lanka, it has about 8,000 kilometers of deep blue ocean before it reaches the Antarctic continent. In that context, Sri Lanka is the, the end of the Central Asian flyway if a bird flies from Asia to South. The Brahma's Bridge is very important in this story because the, some of the birds, in large numbers, fly through this Brahma's Bridge to enter Sri Lanka from the South Asian Peninsula. The Brahma's Bridge is commonly known as Adam's Bridge or Ramaseti or Nalase. These are all different names given to this landmass through time. It's a very old landmass and there are very old stories about it, in, both in India and in Sri Lanka. Rama's Bridge is a very diverse, very important, culturally rich place. From uh, tiny diatoms, algae, to crustaceans, small crustacean-eating fish, to medium-sized fish, to large fish, to dugon, to marine mammals, whales, dolphins, to oceanic birds, shorebirds, to forest birds are all found in, in this stretch of land. Marine invertebrates live in the sandy, shallow seabed as well as uh, warm, stable waters of the Pog Bay, which give rise to, uh, which gives the foundation to this rich ecosystem. Mana is very rich for shellfish, fish, and large fish uh, fishery. Along the Rama's Bridge, about 18 islands are located. Of that, nine belongs to Sri Lanka, and the rest of the nine belongs to the India. Those islands are sandy, and we call them dancing islands because they move slowly in every year with the movement of the oceanic currents and wind. Some of the islands in the Rama's Bridge has small forest patches, and those forest patches are critical for forest birds to move from India to Sri Lanka while they are migrating through the Central Asian flyway. And in Urmal area, where it is mostly forested, these birds that flew thousands of kilometers will reach eventually to the Urumali area. And Urumali area has fairly rich green shrublands, and these shrublands provide the, the vital resupply and resting places for the birds. Because of that, the shrubland environments of Mana, and especially in the western part of Mana, plays a very important role in providing the needed vital energy for these birds that are traveling through the Central Asian flyway. So they are tired, and when they cross Ramasetu, they rest in this Urumal area. That's where we come in and use some of them for our research. These are called misnets. Uh, you know, there are several kinds of mist nets. Uh, the ones that uh, we use in the lagoon, in the, in the near ocean, are mist nets uh, designed for wading birds or shore birds. They are much tougher, bigger, and uh, they are more like fish nets. But these are very delicate, almost transparent, hard to see. And in, in good conditions, uh, like uh, this kind of condition where when it is uh, placed against uh, a darker, cluttered environment, it is almost invisible. That's why we call them mist nets. Uh, so this particular type of mist nets are used for forest birds. Uh, what we try to do here in Mana, this, we are at the, uh, right by the Rama's Bridge. So these sort of small forest patches, they look like just, you know, desolent uh, dry shrubs, but they are actually uh, reminiscent of African uh, uh, acacia forest and uh, these are the, the first uh, kind of refueling stations for these birds that they that uh, cross the Indian Ocean uh, from through Fork Strait and uh, they spend about a day or two or probably even a week and then move into 
inland, sometimes to Horton Plains, sometimes to uh, Singaraja, uh, Vilpattu and all the other places. So these birds we call forest birds because they mostly live in forested areas or sometimes in the deep forest and in the jungle. Wading birds or the show birds, the other side of this story where they move from uh, you know, other wetlands of the world to Sri Lanka and back and forth. Uh, and they normally don't come to this sort of forested areas, they stay in the open wetlands. Uh, so the techniques that we use through the oceans um, are another different kind, a special kind that uh, very hard to study. So most of the studies that uh, we've done in Sri Lanka over the past 100 to 200 years are mostly confined to uh, shorebirds or wading birds and the forest birds. So we are, this is the morning, uh, uh, the mudflats are most active in the morning. Uh, there's two factors in the in this sort of a very large uh, exposed mudflats, uh, you know, has. One is the uh, tide, the, the high tide and the low tide. Near full moon and uh, new moon, you have two cycles of, uh, like in a day, you have two high tides and two low tides. So that tide plays a critical role in this, in this, this sort of exposed mudflats, especially in the northern province and uh, few in the Hanwantata district. You don't have this sort of exposed mud flats in dry, a wet zone uh, and inland. So this is coastal or away from the coast and uh, these are some of the best uh, mud flats for migratory birds in Asia. So it's a, it's a unique place and uh, so one factor is the fa tide, the other factor is the time of the day. Uh, the birds that we are interested in here are mostly shorebirds and few seabirds and the shorebirds are uh, they are they active all, uh, all day around, but they are relatively inactive during midday and midnight. Uh, but most active around 5 o'clock in the morning till about 8 o'clock and again uh, about uh, 5 o'clock in the after evening and till about uh, 8 o'clock. So, so now it's in the morning 6 o'clock, perfect timing in terms of uh, the time of the day and we are at the low tide. So that's the right combination. When those two combinations uh, come into uh, like a superimpose in the, in the favor of the bird, then you have a large aggregation of birds. So we can see about uh, over 50,000 birds in this contract right now. And uh, for a, the, the trick is that if you just looked at it, you see here and there are few birds. But if you look through this, you'll see this mud flat is kind of full of small, 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 small birds. The birds representing about one-third of the terrestrial land of this planet can be found here. So it's a, it's a magnifying glass where like, everything gets concentrated into here where we can see the world, its ecology, biology, toxins uh, from these mud flats. That's why we wanted to put uh, tags and uh, markers to uh, look into the world from here in Sri Lanka but we can see the changes happening in other parts of the world. We learn in at school and other places where tropical rainforest like Singaraja uh, is, has the, the highest biodiversity. However, anybody who been to Singaraja would know very few uh, animals that you can see. And if you go to Boondala or if you go to Kumana or if you go to Mana, you will see like thousands, tens of thousands of birds aggregate in very small areas. And, feed without any fights or competition. How, they, how can they do that? The trick is that they have adaptations to feed in different layers in the wetland. In the drier side layers, in the closer to the land or on the land, birds with short legs and small beaks with large eyes pick insects and other small animals by sight. And then another layer of birds or a line of birds would be placed slightly closer to the water in a slightly wetter ground. They would have slightly longer beaks and they would poke the ground and pick worms a uh, few centimeters below the ground. They, would, they might have smaller eyes because they do not use eyes for feeding. Some birds have even longer beaks. They might go few centimeters deeper, avoiding the, uh, the other birds and feed on 
uh, worms. Some birds have much longer beaks, like a couple of, uh, like you know, about 30 centimeters or about a foot or even longer beaks. They will not compete with others because they will go a couple of, uh, like uh, about a foot deep into the uh, mud and pick larger worms. Some birds have uh, re uh, up curved beaks, so they will not compete with down curved beak birds. And uh, further into the water, for example, like ducks, they'll uh, they have shorter webbed feet, which they can f uh, swim with. For they'll uh, swim into the water, and they'll have soft, flat, small beaks, and they'll dive un into the water uh, and uh, feed on uh, like uh, vegetation, uh, aquatic submerged vegetation, and uh, they'll swim around. And uh, storks, especially the large storks like painted storks, or adjutants or black neck stalks, they will walk into the water with their long legs like a, like a stilt fisherman and uh, wait till large fish come uh, to come and then they will use their powerful beaks to uh, for it. So, none of these layers compete with the other layers. As a result, very large numbers like thousands, tens of thousands and in manna for example, sometimes uh, nearly a million birds can aggregate into one location and without competing for it. Unlike wildlife observations, when you do molecular ecology or wildlife research, sometimes you have to catch these wild birds. And that has to be done in great care. There are specific techniques, there are specific training is required to master those techniques. And you have to practice it and also you need specific legal coverage to do that. And that legal coverage is provided by the research committee of the wildlife department of Sri Lanka. And the techniques can be learned uh, through certain university programs and the practicing has to be done in this sort of banding camps. There are internationally accepted capture methods, internationally accepted capture equipment for this process. And it is a very tedious, very delicate operation where only trained researchers uh, can perform. When we handle birds, there's two main ways of handling. One is called the dander's grip, where you hold the bird using your left palm and uh, you use that grip, the dander's grip, to hold the bird while you are measuring. The the second technique is called photographer's grip, where you hold the bird from the right hand and uh, it exposes the plumage, so it is better for photographing a bird while in captivity. This, this bird is a very unique bird. We caught this bird in 2018 October. That means the fall or the, the, when the beginning of the migration in 2018, in October, we caught this bird. Uh, this is the first uh, lesser sand plover we caught in uh, in this program in MENA. And uh, so, so this bird breeds in Mongolia and came to uh, this mud flat in October and we caught it. Uh, and then we put a, we measure it, we took blood, uh, you know, the fat profiles, the, the molting scores, uh, like you know, basically a kind of health check and the measurements and all. And put a, put this specific metal ring. This ring is a, uh, is a, is a metal, a non-corrosive metal special ring that has uh, some information about where it was banded and also specific number. And also we put a green uh, plastic, uh, in this case a green, it can vary from bird to bird, uh, to uh, uh, locate the bird in the mud flat so we can see that it's banded. And uh, now, this October, uh, we caught it uh, today. And uh, the, the, the important thing about it is that, so normally people would ask like putting a ring and a plastic thing and handling and uh, would this affect these birds? The answer is no, uh, because this bird after it's been caught and measured and, and uh, uh, all the analysis uh, had traveled back to Mongolia in uh, March 2019, that is about six to 7,000 kilometers. And then it bred in uh, Mongolia and in uh, last October, it might have uh, came back to this uh, site, another 7,000, uh, just between the two countries and probably even more because they fly around as well. So this small tiny bird 
had traveled about 20,000 kilometers just simply to get into its breeding site to wintering sites. And uh, we know that because of these rings. So it is critical to understand and what we do, understand these, these birds and what they do and basically how life moves around in the planet. See, this is the wing. So this is this area used for propulsion, forward propulsion. And this area used for lift. And then this bird has another second kind of projection. This is it's a kind of a pseudo wing. So this bird uses two wings. In a normal bird, like if you get a polkich or a demodich or a minor, it doesn't have this part. It's something like this. And it doesn't have elongated this part because it doesn't need that much propulsion. Yeah. So this is like a jet engine, jet like a, fly, a wing of a jet, fly, a fighter jet. Yeah. It has very high propulsion yeah. and uh, it can fly very fast, very long distances. And to facilitate that, it has a second such uh, structure developed yeah. to extra propel it. So, 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 so this is a, like a long distance flying machine, uh, even though it's a tiny bird. So th this doesn't need that extra stopover. Uh, and this in this particular, particular case, in 2018 we had a blood test, uh, a cholesterol check, uh, measurements. Uh, it's basically a general health check of the bird. Now after two years, now we can do it today again. So like a doctor, uh, a medical doctor checking the patient's history, now we can check the, this bird's history, uh, uh, medical history, uh, like you know health and uh, its well-being. And that way we can look into the well-being of the planet. Because you can't just put a, a, a thermometer or, a, or, a, or some equipment to the ground and uh, get that to understand the, how life, how uh, the planet uh, sustains life and how it continues to do that. And are there any problems for that? It can be understood only through uh, studying the health and the, and the well-being of its users. And these are the users. And we are also the users. So what we know, don't learn from them would apply to us. So this, is, so this is not just about birds. This is not just about love for birds or love for nature or uh, getting a good photograph or anything. It's about to understand the, the home, the only home that we live in, the place where we call home and uh, whether it's doing well or whether there are problems. If there's problems, then we can uh, inform the authorities. There's a, there's a myth uh, going on uh, spreading by some people that the, the banding could uh, damage the leg uh, because of the plier. But it's a, it's a myth because these pliers, these are called banding pliers. So they, have, they are specifically constructed to avoid uh, catching uh, the leg, see? So when you even close it, the leg falls, uh, stays within the band without uh, the plier, without uh, causing any damage. So these are special bands, pliers or banding pliers. So if you come for a banding station, then uh, you would know this. But uh, some of these people, they, they, they never seen a banding station, so they don't know what they're talking about. Now we are trying to catch a bird from the wetland. We will try to catch migratory species from the Urumale wetland here. The most exciting as well as most challenging part of a bird research is when you try to catch a bird in the field. It's, it's challenging because it, you have to be worried about the safety of the bird, you have to be worried about the safety of you and the people involved, as well as you have to worry about the safety of the equipment. And at the end of the day, you have to be worried about every aspect of, the, of these steps. Capturing wild birds, normally we use either early in the morning before sunlight or late in the day after sunset. So the dawn and dust is preferred for capturing, uh, partly because the uh, direct sun uh, causing extra stress for these birds, especially when we are handling them anyway, it's very stressful for them. So if we catch them in the wild in midday, uh, it's very stressful for the birds. So we normally use early morning and late evening or night for that purpose. So this is a very exciting find. Uh, this is an exciting bird, uh, in ornithologically speaking. It's a, it's a rare migrant, uh, uh, 
I will come to I like visit Sri Lanka in uh, in October to uh, March and this is called a Terex sandpiper it's a it's a rare migrant even uh, in the birding circle among uh, birders and uh, photographers and this bird has a unique beak you can see that it's an upcurved beak and uh, it it's uniquely uh, evolved to eat things like this uh, that the thing that runs around is called a tiger beetle and these these birds feed on small insects on the mud flat and uh, we strategically place these nets to catch birds like this but they are very valuable birds in terms of its biodiversity value and they are very delicate people would think that they they would be very dangerous because with the sharp beaks actually they have very delicate beaks they are like butterflies very delicate but they can fly 25 30000 kilometers uh, one way and twice a year uh, for, from their breeding grounds to here and spend 6 months in sri lanka and uh, spend 6 months in their breeding grounds so uh, how you identify your terex and piper it has red uh, like orange legs short legs and a very long upcurved beak we'll first extract the bird and then uh, i'll show you how you how you identify it so it's right now in a in a small tiny pocket uh, that uh, that it itself created by uh, moving so i'm just uh, it in the bird out from that pocket we are going to do now so we'll uh, securely place this bird in this bag which is called we call it a bird bag it's a very secure way of uh, mo moving a bird from one place to another and uh, so gaimini will help me with that and then we'll uh, place a uniquely numbered uh, metal band and a, uh, a flag we'll explain what it is uh, when we are doing it and we, the, the flag will go to its leg and it it will carry a unique number with a specific identifier for sri lanka uh, this is a small bird so we can't put a satellite tag for it but uh, we will uh, we will take quite valuable uh, scientific information and we then after we'll release the bird back to its initial capture place which is this mud flat people would wonder why we put these birds into a cloth bag why not a cage cage is a bad idea because uh, when you put a bird in a cage it will try to fly around injure itself its beaks could get uh, injured wings feathers could get disrupted it could see other people and also they get stressed and all in a cloth bag like a person before a surgery this bird the cloth bag will take the shape of the bird bird will be won't have any hard surfaces to hit as well as so the bird will be in a darker place inside the bag as a result bird would be calm less stressed and it doesn't have any place to fly around and get injured so that is why we put a bird in a bird bag we call this cloth bag a bird bag and this bird bag will be taken into the banding camp and we'll get the bird out from it in a banding camp we study bird biology their ecology their migration patterns their molting patterns how the feathers grow how they fare this uh, treacherous journey and all that is the research aspect one another very important aspect of a banding camp is through the sri lankan national university system we train future scientists we train future ornithologists we train future biologists field researchers under the actual field conditions that is extremely important for the sustainability of sri lankan science because these kids will learn the techniques the actual do's and don'ts in the field under real field conditions with the same pressure that senior researcher would feel and uh, after the graduation maybe after years of practice they'll contribute to the science of biology in sri lanka here we have molecular biology special students we have zoology special students we have environment science special students of the fourth and third year level classes in from the university of colombo they are all are special students of the department of zoology and environment sciences of the university of colombo i am conducting a practical class while i am doing the research so this is a, a combo package where students will get trained to do research they learn how the ways of the birds as well as they'll participate in practical class for their respective courses so the green green color code the metal bands has 
a specific number. The plastic flags also has a specific number. But generally, the plastic flag or these green colored small plastic pieces play a special role because a photographer could photograph this in the field. So reciting or identifying these birds in the field doesn't require a recapture. So this, with the advent of the digital photography, now we use these plastic leg flags so that we could track the movement of birds through digital photographs. Korakulam freshwater tank is another unique place in Mena. Mena generally is a salty place. It has the ocean, it has salty marshes, it has salty lagoons. In Korakulam, this lake has fresh water. So because of that, the Mena horses, Mena donkeys, fishing cats, jungle cats, the grace and the loris that we have here in Mena, most of the birds visit this freshwater lake for drinking water. For that matter, Korakulam is a very important lifeline for most of the animals living in the Mena Island. We count large numbers of migratory ducks in uh, Korakulam. Sometimes a flock of 10,000, a flock of 5,000, uh, like large uh, flocks of migratory ducks can be seen in this location during the winter months. Here, we try to tag a Eurasian region a migratory duck from Siberia that only visit to the northern wetlands in Sri Lanka. But in the north, they can be found in large numbers, nowhere else in the island. And uh, we try to tag this vision. We call it Gulsari, a character in Central Asian novel. We hope that Gulsari will tell us the connectivity of wetlands in the Mana Island, in the northern sector of Sri Lanka and beyond. Gamini, uh, we, uh, we caught that uh, uh, two uh, visions, uh, uh, the, especially the Gulsari, the one we call Gulsari, the Eurasian vision, the female vision, uh, and we release it at uh, Korakulam, you could remember, right? Yes. So, uh, so can you tell me like how, how what happened then after? Now you have a fair bit of data. Uh, yes, sir. from the Korakulam tank where it was released, it first mm -hmm. flies to Wankala sanctuary. Now this is the, the bird sanctuary, the Ramsar site where like thousands of migratory shorebirds okay. and ducks and gather and the flamingos. Flamingos, are, the flamingos right? Normally are, people yeah. go and watch. Ne? That's uh, where the big duck The big duck, duck flocks okay. form, yeah. uh, like uh, about 10,000 of ducks at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, from Wankhane Sanctuary, so this place they use it for foraging during the daytime. Mm -hmm. And from there they fly to Veditalatim Nature Reserve, another foraging ground. So these, are, these two uh, spots were frequently used by Gulsari. Yeah. And then uh, so you, so we know that they eventually has to go uh, north. Yes. So can you can you tell yes, what you uh, what you found there? So from Mana, so they depart on February. Uh, Gulsari departed on February seventh. Okay. So they, she flew through Irunathi Island uh -huh. here in the Pork Bay. So Irunathi Island was important if you remember, so that all the uh, migratory shorebirds and ducks. Uh, during the, the northern migration, they stop they at stop. least once. Yes. Yeah, that's a very important wetland in the Fog Bay system. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, after they uh, uh, leave uh, Fog Bay, mm -hmm. they fly straight north, right? Uh, it happens like this, sir. So, February 24th, they depart Sri Lanka and first they enter Tamil Nadu coast and mm -hmm. uh, fly along the coastline till Andhra Pradesh. Uh -huh. And from there, they enter central India and fly uh, kind of uh, north, north. Do they follow direction. a river there? Uh, yeah. Actually, no. They uh, flew they directly uh, to uh, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh border. So, here uh -huh. there is a reservoir called Gobin Sagar where they uh, stayed for six weeks and this was the first stopover site uh, in the northward migratory road. I see, there must be fat. So these uh, uh, stopover sites are the refueling stations for these birds. When they fly thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of kilometers into the Arctic, they need to stop and refuel. Like when we are on the move for a longer journey, we stop at uh, gas stations, petrol sheds for refueling. Similarly, these guys have to do that. Without these stopover sites, uh, the population will die because they won't be able to make to the, the destination. So then after what happened, Gavin? Uh, from there, sir, now this was uh, during May. 
and uh, in early June they again departed the second uh, phase of oh, its so migratory journey. So they spent few weeks. Yes, yeah, uh, six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so then it uh, uh, started uh, the second uh, phase, phase of its migration and uh, completed it in one go. It uh, actually flies over uh, uh, New Delhi, Agra. Haryana Punjab states and finally arrive in its destination at Himachal Pradesh. I the see. destination was the, the Pongdam Reservoir. I uh, see. It's a, 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 a wetland of global importance okay. at Ramsar site. And that's uh, in like the that's Indus Valley. Yeah. Close that's to one of the Valley. key yeah. uh, migratory yes. entry and exit entry points, point right? To the okay. Yes. Okay. From leaving Mana, now we are entering into the Boondala wetland system in the southern point of the Central Asian flyway. Because Boondala, beyond Boondala, is the ocean of about 8,000 kilometer wide ocean that spans from Boondala to all the way to Antarctica. So a bird that flies from north and if you continue to fly south, it will enter somewhere in the southern Sri Lanka and Boondala is one place where it has to stop. So Boondala has been recognized as a Ramsar wetland because of very high density of migratory birds over winter, every year in this place. Boondala used to have about 2,000 flamingos in the winter months. It used to have thriving shellfish fishery like prawns, lobster and shrimp. And uh, it used to have a fairly good numbers of some of the most important birds in the Central Asian flyway. Unfortunately, due to very bad planning, in the mid-90s, some of the excess water from the inland tanks of the Hambantota district are channeled to Boondala, and with that destroys the Boondala lagoon ecosystem. Now Boondala has mostly fresh water, and as a result, no food for migratory birds because they rely on the marine invertebrates, and the marine invertebrates can't live in fresh water. So as a result, the lobster fishery, the shrimp fishery, and the crab fishery that was thriving till mid-90s disappeared. People got poor, and uh, very few birds now can come and overwinter in Boondala. We are at Boondala here. Uh, so we maintain this uh, banding uh, ringing camps in Mana and Boondala uh, four times a year. Uh, I'm superficially for a casual uh, observer. Uh, Boondala has a saltan, man-made saltan. Uh, so as uh, Mana, Mana has a saltan, and uh, uh, Mana has one Kali Ramsa site. Uh, Boondala has the Boondala Ramsa site. Ramsa sites are the the globally most significant wetlands. Uh, recognized by the, into the global conventions. Uh, so it is uh, not just important wetland for Sri Lanka and its birds uh, and its uh, environment, it is uh, considered a global insignificant uh, place. Uh, so, uh, so by looking at it uh, superficially, they both has these uh, salt turns, uh, salt uh, exposed mud flats and uh, shrub forest. They both belong to the arid zone of Sri Lanka. However, when you look closely, for example, if you spend a day in Boondala banding station and a day in Talemana banding station, you get a night and day type difference where you get totally different uh, composition of show birds, both migratory birds as well as resident birds. In uh, Boondala, you get mostly little stints, uh, lesser sand plovers, curlew sandpipers, and red shanks. In uh, Mana, you get very different composition. You get bar tail godwits, crab plover, greater sand plovers, and a bit of uh, lesser sand plovers. And so, on. so, uh, so the general composition uh, and the, even the adaptations of these birds that you see in Mana uh, is different from uh, the birds that you see in Boondala. Boondala represent more uh, like a Sri Lankan arid zone features uh, in the environment as well as the birds uh, living in it. Uh, Mana represent more like Indian, southern arid Indian uh, ecosystem and uh, the birds in it, uh, like uh, even even the resident birds like the long tail strikes, uh, collared doves, uh, and then grey francolins you don't see in uh, in Boondala. So so a day in, uh, in a, this sort of a banding camp would be very different uh, uh, for a band or a naturalist or a scientist when you compare that to, uh, to uh, a day in Mana. So let's see, we are going to process this bird. This is a pied kingfisher. It's not a rare bird, but this particular species is a, it's a true, truly adapted species to live with uh, kind of a, an open water uh, environment.
pike kingfisher is an interesting bird because it's a it's a truly a, a, a wetland kingfisher, and it's black and white. Uh, it's a beautiful bird, but in our research context, it has a lower priority for us because it's a resident species. It doesn't migrate. So what we do here, since we caught this beautiful bird, we put color rings instead of the metal rings because metal rings and the flags are expensive. So we use only the relatively cheaper color rings for them so that we could identify this bird later in the Boondal environment, but it won't, we don't expect it to fly long distances. Uh, in the banding stations, we study the health of these captured birds. Uh, we run uh, blood tests, uh, cholesterol tests, and uh, sometimes uh, tests for heavy metals and uh, bacteria, nowadays viruses. So a kind of a, a complete health check. We wanted to do that because partly we wanted to understand the health of the individual bird. We want to understand the health of the environment that they live in the health of the wetland, the health of the forest, the health of the neighboring areas, and so on. Also, we wanted to understand the health of the, the great ecosystem, either in Boondala or in Mana and so on. Also, we are interested in the health of the planet. Uh, migratory birds are specifically good for that because they fly long distances across the globe. So we would get a, a snapshot of the health of the planet or health of the globe by understanding the health of the migratory bird. Even though we use mist nets for medium and smaller size birds, uh, to uh, catch larger birds, we use other techniques. There are other standard techniques to catch large birds. In public television, uh, uh, all these capture techniques cannot be explained, but this, there are specific approval process, legal process authorized by the Department of Wildlife Conservation for these techniques, and also internationally accepted methods are there. So we use those, uh, but we can't show that in TV. In this session, so we got a uh, Asiatic spoonbill, which is a non-migratory bird, but a very interesting bird because the part is very pretty and it's also it's big and it uses the, the Boondala great ecosystem. So we wanted to see how this bird utilized this ecosystem along the run. Some scientists uh, that uh, this uh, mode of feeding uh, using this sort of a specialized beak is a bit of a disadvantage for these birds. That's why they are getting rarer and rarer. So, and also, even though this is a, a resident bird, we thought to put a satellite tag, uh, partly because this bird is a uh, threatened bird in Sri Lanka and also across the globe. It got lots of uh, parasites. Look, tons of them. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, it's, uh, we caught this bird in Boondala National Park. Boondala is a, a system of protected areas where Boondala, uh, then Yala, Lunugambihira and Udavala uh, are uh, protected areas, significant protected areas and Kalamati in the region. So we wanted to see how this bird would utilize this uh, protected area network in this southern, uh, the heart of this, uh, one of the most important wetland systems in the, in, in the entire world. Uh, so we, we would like to see whether this bird stays throughout its uh, time in Boondala or would it fly to uh, Lunugambehera or Udavalava or to Yala or Kalamatiya or would it use uh, paddy, privately owned paddy fields or would it stay in state uh, protected areas throughout the time and uh, how long will it stay. So Dr. Nilmini Jayasena from uh, uh, veterinary faculty, University of Peradin here, She's studying uh, yeah, uh, parasites and heavy metal contamination of these birds. Uh, so she will uh, try to parasitize <laughs> and scavenge a little bit. But these are important information. When we catch them, yes, we definitely uh, kind of harass them. They have more. But at the same time, we try to know more about them so that uh, we could uh, help them in the long run. 
and uh, people like these uh, wildlife officers hopefully would use this sort of technologies and also the data coming out from such technologies for better management planning and uh, implementation. Right, now we are going to prepare the jacket. So this, this jacket, this uh, tag has to go on to the top of the bird and, uh, and then this harness is made out of this. This is uh, uh, kite surfing uh, uh, grade, uh, actually this material are used for kites, if. Uh, parachutes and uh, gliders. So it's, a, it's very tough and this has to last for about 20 years because these birds live long life, long, they have long lives and, uh, and it has to be lightweight and super strong. All the material, the, even this, are all may use for parachutes and gliders. Uh, so it's a, it's a very high quality material that we are using. So I, I must say that uh, this is a collaboration. This particular moment is itself a collaboration between two uh, universities, uh, Peradena University and Un University of Colombo, and especially the Field Oncology Group of Sri Lanka, which is part of the University of Colombo, and uh, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences providing this technology for us in a collaborative basis. Uh, wildlife Department, uh, there are a few officers here. So they are collaborating with us, they are providing facilities and uh, the permits and all. And then the, as the national broadcaster, uh, Rupahini Corporation is uh, helping to get the message out. So, I mean, we have to, like, you know, the country is developed like this. Uh, we have to do small things, big things uh, together in a collaborative manner. Uh, so, so that is what we are all doing here. So we have this uh, Asiatic spoon wheel. Uh, so we are going to uh, put a GPS tag or a satellite tag onto this bird. Uh, this is a fairly big bird, about 1,800 grams, uh, heavy. It's one of the heaviest birds that we are going to tag anyway. And uh, for that, we have this 23 gram tag, which is the heaviest tags we have. And uh, it's very sophisticated, very nice plastic case and the solar panel is elevated uh, so that the feathers can grow between the tag and the panel mm, and so we have the luxury of putting a slightly heavier tag because uh, this bird is much heavier than uh, the tag so the international uh, standard is the tag has to be uh, less than three percent of the body weight of the bird that means it's actually lighter than a, an average meal of a bird so so what we are going to put this 23 gram uh, tag so after mounting the tag, uh, the jacket, and then the tag onto the bird, uh, we can release the bird. So now we are going to uh, safely release this bird back into its environment with the tag on, and the tag is now on. So after about uh, eight hours from now on, it will start to give data for us. So we came from one Ramsar site in the north to another Ramsar site in the south to understand more about this uh, phenomena of migration. However, in Boondala, we happened to caught a, a resident species. We didn't plan for it, but we caught it. Uh, so, Gaimini, tell us me how this data behaves in this uh, spoonbill uh, and uh, its movements. Yes, sir. so this is where Bundala uh, Salton, uh, right here, this is where it was tagged and released. And uh, this happened, the tagging we did in January. Uh, so within January, this is how it moved around the wetlands uh, around Bundala Salton and so Bundala National Park later uh, okay. in February uh, and March. Uh -huh. So this is how it moved. It moved uh, more towards uh, uh, like uh, to, uh, towards west malala, malala, and uh, yeah. used uh, Malala and uh, Americala uh, mm -hmm. Lagoon. And, but always uh, made sure that uh, it flew back to uh, uh, the Bundala salt. And it yeah. uh, stays within the, this is a close up of it, mm -hmm. it stays yes. within the forest. Yes. So it, it didn't really leave the national park, right? Yes. It's kind of confined. Probably, uh, I mean, birds, they don't know the boundaries, human boundaries. So this is what we found over the past uh, several years of working with these messengers uh, from 
the earth. Uh, we are a center of global movement. We are connected to Africa, we are connected to Middle East, we are connected to Scandinavia, we are connected to Arctic, we are connected to rest of Asia and Far Eastern Russia as well as Australia. We are truly a, a, a global hub. And these birds uh, and their movements tell us much more than uh, a story of birds. They uh, tell a story of us. They tell us who we are, where we come from, and what kind of connectivity Sri Lanka has with the rest of the world through life. Because birds are living, breathing uh, things that fly across the globe and connects the Arctic communities, that connects the Himalayan uh, communities, connects the African, Australian communities with communities in Sri Lanka. We know now some of these birds that we tagged in Mana, for example, flew 20 to 25,000 kilometers into Arctic and back. We know that some of the birds that we tagged in Pesale in, at sea level flew 24,000 feet into the mountains and one bird in fact crossed over Everest and went into Tibet and bred. Uh, some of our birds went into uh, the Central Asian fly, uh, grasslands and uh, some stayed within Sri Lanka, like the one that we tagged uh, in Boondala. So, so this has a huge significance about our science education, about our ornithology, about our national defense, what kind of bacteria, what kind of diseases come and go from Sri Lanka, what kind of uh, uh, biological threats that we could have in the future, a national defense uh, related matter. It tells about how our wetlands connected to the wetlands of the world. It tells about how connected we are in as, as a as a ecosystem, as a as a as a as a life uh, sustaining entity. It tells us how important Sri Lanka in the global biodiversity conservation, our value in the global protection of animals and plants in this planet. It gives a sense of pride, sense of belonging. Uh, we are not just an isolated island. We are a, a hub, a, a central point in the global movement. The Silk Road, the maritime Silk Road in the bird world is here in Sri Lanka.